Good afternoon. I am here with my uh, guest, uh, poet, writer, memorist, uh, Richard Hoffman. Uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, Noon Until Night, a collection of poetry, as well as uh, other projects he's in, been involved in over the years. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Doug. Um, Richard, I was going to, uh, I'll read a brief introduction to Richard. Um, Richard Hoffman is the author of six previous books of poetry, the poetry collections Without Paradise, Gold Star Road, and Emblem, the memoirs Love and Fury and Half the House, and the short story collection Interference and Other Stories. He's a senior writer in residence at the uh, at Emerson College in Boston, Mass. Um, you've been on here once before, a while, a long time ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. it must be 10 years ago. It be now. 10 years ago. Um, so, um, you know, you have a new book out, uh, Noon Until Night, from the, um, what press is that again? The uh, Barrow Street. Barrow, Barrow, Barrow Street, Street, Street Press. Good press. Um, now, you know, what do you, what do you bring to this body? That's, what does this bring to your body of work? Uh, this something new or some different perspective? Do you, for instance, consent to being one ring in the river and an unending, no, one ring on the river? And it, how's that go? One, one ring, ring on the river in unending rain. In unending rain. I mean, are you now feel more like that than before you were more struggling and uh, you have to bring this different perspective? Well, I think that there was a moment in the writing of that poem where right. the poem comes to rest there. Yeah. Uh, that Titled poem, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Noon Until Night. But, uh, well, I don't, I, I don't think I, I rest content, uh, as content as that line would suggest. Oh, it's, a, it's a resting place. Okay. You know, but, uh, you know, it's a harbor. Uh -huh. But then you, you set sail again from there. Yeah. But so for I mean, a long time there was no harbor. I think you're, you're right. right. I mean, for a long time there was. Uh, you know, you you get a little older and you begin to. Uh, the things that you thought were important turn out not to be as important as as other things. And so is this? Uh, how? So I mean, is this new perspective? Which is evident in your book now wasn't as evident in other proceeding. I think it's there. I think I think it was it was there in uh, in Emblem, there right. in Gold Star Road. Right. The seeds of it were there very early on. Uh -huh. I think I think it's just part of you know who who you are that you know you things body forth over time and then you get to see more clearly what. So what maybe are, it's a little out of focus in previous themes, books, and it's coming into exactly, fine tuning. Exactly. Yeah. What are your themes? What are your what, what are your concerns? What are your obsessions? What uh, uh, what are what are your at least provisional certainties about being a human being? And uh, and it takes time for that for those things to come clear. Okay. Okay. So you're well down the river and. Are becoming <laughs> <laughs> or up the creek without a paddle, <laughs> whichever. Now, you, you use a quote from uh, Yeats, uh, give me an old man's frenzy, my f my, my myself must be remade. Uh, are you still sort of, I mean, this probably is similar to the other question, you're still raging against the, the dying of a oh, life well, you want to remake? No, that, that uh, epigraph yeah. leads, a, leads off a poem that's uh, a villanelle. Right. It's really in the voice of my father. Okay. Uh, I feel that that poem is almost a translation of um, what he would have said had he been able to articulate uh, mm -hmm. what he was going through in his final year mm -hmm. when I was with him quite a bit. Um, and you use the sea as one, is he a swell rather than a wave? And How does a swell become a wave? A wave yeah. It's his question. Yeah, can't, you know. And you saw that in your father towards yes, the Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I think it's hard to uh, talk about that without the poem itself. Right, I mean, right. But uh, perhaps uh, you'll read it uh, when. I'll read it. Here, read it now. Do you have it there? Uh, it's in the book. <laughs> yes. That was just one of my questions. Let me. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's the wave. The epigraph is from Yeats, grant me an old man's frenzy, myself must I remake. How does a swell become a wave? What pushes up from underwater? Tell me, 
This tired body is all I have become of all I tried to be. I move more slowly now and wonder, how does a swell become a wave? There isn't much I wouldn't give for strength and will to rise together again in this tired body. But if all I have is this one heavy life, then let me heave it somehow, all of it, into the future, the way a swell becomes a wave that rolls for miles to a beach or cove or thunders on rock and shatters. I am tired of this tired body. All I have to live for, my children, others I love, I'm too fatigued for them to matter. How does a swell become a wave? Tell me, this tired body is all I have. I'm now I, I you know I might make the mistake of um, that often people do of putting you know saying this is exactly about the poet himself, but but in fact the poem is is is, is universal, isn't it? I well, mean, I think I, I think if you. I mean, it's just not about your father. No, I hope that when a person says the poem, yeah, that they are the person saying it and feeling what what it means to say that. I um, mean, I think that's you know, in some ways, what poems do. Often, a lyric poem is a dramatic monologue for the person reading it mm -hmm. to take to slip into that character, and that's an act of empathy, and that's part of the communication of the poem. Sometimes I think that poems are, uh, are poems on the page are like musical scores. Well, there has I, to be a musicality to poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that they don't really become poems until someone speaks them, just the way that the music doesn't become music until someone plays it. Right now, it's so the it's poem no can't be complete just on the page. It has to be on the stage, so to speak. Well, the stage could be the inside of my head, yeah. sitting in, under a lamp, reading right. it sub-verbalizing the poem but listening to the poem mm -hmm. and until the poem is that's what makes it a song that's what makes poetry songs Be, it's something to listen to it's not just to read with your eyes there are exceptions to that there's concrete poetry there are other uh, uh, aesthetics but the general current forever and ever has been that poetry is either sung or spoken in a way that uh, is to be heard, and in some ways uh, is really addressed to the reader's ear, whether the reader is in an audience uh, uh, in public or uh, sitting in a chair in private. Um, it's really addressed to the reader's ear. So that poem in the book is like a musical score, and you then, you, then you read it a few times to figure out how to sing it or, quote, sing it say it uh, the same way you would if you were uh, a sight reader trying to uh, and picked up a new hymn in church or a, or, or a new song to perform on stage uh, you know you have to kind of teach it to yourself once or a little bit uh, you, it's hard to just sight read something and play it right like that unless you're a really good musician mm -hmm. you know, or really good and very well versed good pun uh, reader of poems uh, but I do think um, that they're written for the reader to hear. Now, um, which is why I love the Villanelle, by the way. What's that? Which is why I love the form of the Villanelle, by uh -huh. the way, because it's so much. You're waiting for the return of those lines and seeing how they return this and time. And for the for the for the layman, what is uh, the Villanelle? Well, Villanelle is a, f a French poetic form that was based in a peasant dance. It, you know, if you if you've ever done any line dancing or contra dancing, or all the time, you see, you know, there are patterns to it. You know, things. Uh, you know, you do you do si do and you skip to my loo or whatever mm -hmm. you do. I don't know. I don't do that, but the, it's a, it's based on a dance in which people peel off and return at different times. And um, so the villanelle is based in two rhymes and two repeating lines that leapfrog over one another throughout the poem until they click together as the final couplet. Mm -hmm. And along the way, they can be inflected or um, uh, you know, uh, modified a little bit, but not so much that the reader wouldn't recognize them, because some of the pleasure of the form is to hear that mm -hmm. 
that line come back. Mm -hmm. So it's a musical pleasure to mm -hmm. hear it. Just mm -hmm. the, you know. Okay. Now, um, you know, I think I mentioned in the only review you got from this book, and, and for folks out there, this book should be reviewed by more than just me. Um, uh, uh, your, your collections, and spec specifically in the title poem, could be a primer for life. Um, and, um, you know, um, what you experienced uh, in your life, uh, I know that from your memoir, partially from one of your memoir, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you can give the benefit of um, your experience. And I think it's reflected some, in some ways in, the, in, in the, that poem that you go out there and you're going to get advice and you have to make your decisions. And it's sort of, um, I mean, could it be viewed that way? I mean, it can be viewed many ways. But you, you're talking about the title poem? The title yeah. poem. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think it's, a, it's about the second half of life. That's why it's called Noon Until Night. Mm -hmm. It's really about the challenges of the second half of life. Uh, you know, waking up in the middle of your life, and um, this is why perhaps the the uh, epigraph is from Dante. Okay. Uh, but it's not it's not from the usual, from the inferno. It's from the purgatorio, because that's what the second half of life feels like—a purging, a kind of a, a cleansing, a kind of burning off of uh, what's inessential. Uh, at its best, that's mm -hmm. what the second half of life is, which is not to say that that process isn't also painful. Um, and so that's where I was headed in that poem. But in the, the interesting thing, and I'm, I'm telling state secrets here, is that uh, that's a poem based on uh, the 12 hours between noon and midnight. And each section of that poem, the t 12 lines, begins with some reference oblique, hopefully almost so oblique that you wouldn't really uh, fix on it, uh, uh, on a number. So by the time you get through the first section, you're at one. You've moved from noon to one. By the time you get to the end of the second section, now we're talking about pairs and mm -hmm. twos, and then we're talking about the three-dimensional world. So we're now moving from two to three. And we move that way in terms of the, the references mm -hmm. uh, in the poem at the beginning and end of each section through the 12 hours. Mm -hmm. That's not necessary to understanding the, the, poem. the poem, the content of the poem, or what the poem might say to a reader. Mm -hmm. um, but it was an interesting way to proceed because I don't have access to all of that, uh, all of uh, whatever insider is in that poem. I don't have access to that just by calling it up. The poem has to pull it out of me. And so when you get something like that, there's a kind of a, uh, a formal engine, if you will, that's taking the poem down the track. Then you have to kind of keep up with it and keep feeding it. And it's almost like you, 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 you're referring back to what many poets have told me is that the poem actually comes to them. You're saying the poem absolutely, it, absolutely. It comes to you yes. and it's almost a takes from yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. things I, that I, you weren't able to perhaps articulate and yes. you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, and I think that uh, my sense of of writing poems is that you're always asking what this poem is trying to become. Is this, does this poem want to be a villanella? So you don't or sit there, this is what I'm going to do, you don't write an no, outline. No, it's that, it's right, it, right. Isn't, it isn't a right. piece of journalism. It, right. it isn't a, a, a report or it isn't, you know, it's, um, it, it's a going to the deep well of language and your own experience of language and the reservoir of the imagery of your life and the uh, connections that you make that you don't even know you made that are deeper than the, the level of your... And when you're really going at it, you actually feel emotionally. Oh, I mean, yeah. There's, a, there's a great emotion in the poem when you're hitting on something. You yes. Know? And, yes. You, you, you know, it's, it's, it's very primal experience oh, yeah. in some ways, yeah. you know. It's refreshing. It's it is refreshing. refreshing because you're... Uh, it, you know, because you're just out of the moment. You're in this 
you know, this headset that's and totally you're let unique. go. You're letting go yeah. of the ego. Yeah, in a, in a lot, that's in, it. in a way, you're 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 just like a musician finding a, a chord progression on a guitar right, right, right. and falling in love with it, and then make and letting it become a song. Yeah, uh, it's not y you that you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it in dialogue with the poem that is trying to come into the world. Yeah, and getting better as a poet means being better able to listen to the first few tentative uh, sounds that are coming from your uh, working of the words and trying to tease out this poem, help it come into the world. And that to me is a more fruitful way of looking at it than deciding yeah, I, yeah, that this is what I want to write about. I often don't know what a poem is about for a long time, you know, I sometimes I've finished it, and I, I know that it's finished. It makes a shape, it ha it, it has a uh, emotional weight mm -hmm. to it. Uh, but uh, then I go to title it, you know, and I said I don't know how to title this because I don't know what the hell it is, you know. And then I start, maybe I'm revising it a little more, maybe I'm tinkering with it a little more until I until it gels, and then I know what was trying to come into the world through me. I don't mean that, that's not like a mystical thing. That's just what it is to engage with language at that level. Mm -hmm. Now, we both knew the late poet Sarah Hannah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you taught with her. Um, she was at Emerson. Yes. Uh, and she died very young at 40 from tragic suicide. Uh, you know, I, I've interviewed her here on the show and other things. And again, um, I don't know if it's true or not, I'm not gonna forget it, but you did see, you, you, you know, in the poem, you imagine seeing a ghost of Sarah Hannah. And um, you know, there's an interesting last line in that poem. Uh, you, you know, you're not, you said you don't wanna make the, I paraphrase, of course, you don't wanna make the um, human noise, not voice that says, you know, that turns us away from meaning. Um, can you expand, uh, expand on that uh, a little? Oh, it's you difficult to, to yeah. do that. I mean, I think that... Um, because I think we do, I think we do sort of um, pashaw, you know, things that we see uh, as signs and, you know, the universe sending us uh, signals because we're just so involved in the material world and we just, you know, yeah. we're not in the, yeah, I, I yeah, don't know yeah. if that's... It's a huge question that has to do with um, the supernatural. Right. And is there such a thing? Or, uh, or is it is the fact that I believed I saw her uh, through uh, a, a group of people all waiting for their luggage in the airport in Dublin, in Ireland, that uh, obviously there was someone who looked like her. That's obvious to me in my workaday uh, perceptions of, of how the world works. Like, oh, I mean, off, especially if you're in New England, if you're in Boston, you go to Ireland, you keep seeing your neighbors everywhere you go, but of course they're not your neighbors. It's just the same faces. Uh, but anyway, I did see, I had this uh, this startling moment, like, wait, that's Sarah, but Sarah has died. It can't be Sarah. Uh, it's only a moment, but and then you correct yourself. What if you what if you didn't correct yourself, and and uh, what if not this was really Sarah visiting from some supernatural realm, but what if you took it seriously, the fact that you thrilled to the idea that it was her? What does that mean about the relationship you have with this person even after she's died? And, and examining that for meaning. What, what was that? You know, wh why, why did you thrill so to the possibility of that being her? Uh, and that's rather even, that's than, in rather some than ways make, that's even more interesting than... Yeah, yeah, it's more interesting than the supernatural. Right. The supernatural is too comic book for me. It's yeah. too easy. Uh, but, uh, but rather than dwell on that and try to make meaning of it, most of the time what we do is, oh, oh well, of course it wasn't her. Where's my bag? You know, here comes my bag down the belt. All right, we'll get... And then you just forget about it. And, and I was thinking about that moment which is not, not recapturable, 
and thinking, well, maybe next time I won't do that. Maybe next time I'll say, why, why did I see this friend who is no yeah. longer with us? The unexamined I life. A, it's, it's I had a very similar experience with uh, uh, the death of my friend Kurt Brown. The poet. The poet Kurt Brown. And I thought I had, I, I wrote a little poem that I, I, I don't know if I can say it. It was very short, but um, uh, it was about, I, I won't try to quote it, it was about seeing him on the street and immediately knowing that it wasn't him and trying very hard to blur my vision so that I could continue to see it as him, even right. though I knew it wasn't him. So that yearning is there. And that's more of that poem is about that yearning than, um, in the supernatural. I want to have some time to read you, uh, read some poems from you. You know, you got about uh, mm. seven minutes, uh, sure. Uh, so, or, or less, probably about five minutes. So maybe if you want to ah. read a few poems. Well, okay. I uh, hadn't thought about what to read. Now well, I would, now I feel like I'm characterizing. Oh, read Sarah Hannell. Characterizing. If you want to, All right. Well, you want we just yeah. talked about that. Yeah. So that would be a, a good one to read. It's called Ghost. I don't know the first thing to say about the dead, not even how to begin to think about them. Unsure if visitations in dreams or otherwise are real or merely literary, I don't even know if I should call this hope or superstition, but I saw you in the Dublin airport at the baggage carousel in January, perplexity, impatience, and anticipation in your gaze as you stared at me before I lost you in a crowd. It could be that I saw you then because I loved you, or was starting to. I loved your laugh and miss it, crossing at that busy corner between our offices and classrooms. It could be only that I needed to acknowledge that. If you appear again, this time I'll try not to make that noise the living make with our breath that's not a word that lets us turn from meaning, shrug, and walk away. So it's interesting because uh, that poem is paired uh, on a facing page with a, a short poem called Chimera which is about a similar misapprehension uh, and, what, and the possible meaning of it. That when, when we miss, it's almost like a, a Freudian slip, you know, there's, there's something real that, that slips. And when our perception of something slips, it still has something to say about us. It still has something. And, and this is about that, it's called Chimera. Again and again I mistake the knot on that branch for a bird. Each morning, the same figure emerging from the linden's chiaroscuro. Could it be that as the knot reappears, the bird I saw resumes its duty, welcoming the newly inanimate dead? Is that why I have never heard it? If so, I admire its steadfast perch, its sublime and silent call of warning, its patient waiting for the day when I am not so easily and fortunately fooled. Um, that's, it, it's interesting to think of those two poems yeah. together, you know. Um, um, you don't throw poems in a book randomly together. No, you not try to at have all. Some. Not at all. Um, I think I'd like to read a, 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 a political poem called Of Thee. Of Thee? My country wonders at the looks it gets. It likes to hang around the Army-Navy store, admiring this uniform and that insignia, badges and big blocky numbers for everyone, singing, take me out to the ball game, off key. 
It is always looking in the gutters for money. With a gun from its collection, it shot itself right smack in the history. It can't remember. Something's been stolen, but it can't say what. It can't remember, so everything happens now. It likes to hang around the Army-Navy store, admiring this uniform and that insignia, badges and big blocky numbers for everyone, singing, take me out to the ball game, off key. Very apropos. <laughs> so, I don't know, do we have time for one more? I think we do, right. but I'll keep the tape running just for the okay. sake of... Uh, okay. Um, this is a poem uh, about my mother called Shoes. Called what? Shoes. My mother cut holes in her shoes so her corns would stick out, not torment her, standing all day in a mill folding woolen sweater. Her shoes stank. They were ugly. Twin lobsters in a tank at the market, laces defeated antennae, children tapping at the glass saying, ew. And she cut linoleum to cover from inside the holes in the soles because those were the only shoes she could bear to wear to work and because she needed to work. And she soaked her feet in the evening and smoked and listened to the radio and imagined walking where? So you can get this book at Amazon.com uh, and Barrow Street, right? Do you have a Correct. website? Um, I do, it's richardhoffman.org. Okay, and uh, actually I'm gonna be teaching uh, your memoir at Endicott College, uh, Half the House, um, and uh, you've agreed um, after bribing you with coffee at the Block 11 Cafe to, <laughs> to, uh, to That was uh, not a bribe. I no, paid no, no, for no, my no. own oh, coffee. That's right. That's right. I forgot <laughs> about that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm happy to come. I'm, I'm always happy to talk to students. And the memoir was very visceral about your child abuse and um, uh, you coming to terms with it. Um, I guess this has been asked of you many times. Was it a catharsis writing the book in some respects? Um, no, okay. only because that word suggests a kind of um, finished, mm -hmm. or, you know, you're done with it, you expelled it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's wrongheaded when it comes to our own histories. Mm -hmm. You don't expel a piece of your history. You integrate it into who you are. You find a way to make it um, a part of you that isn't destructive. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for being a guest on the show. Sure. Thanks, Doug.